In this lesson, we'll talk about applications of linear equations. Before we start working with applications, that means word problems, let's review some key words that it's good to recognize when translating English phrases into algebraic expressions. So here's a table of keywords representing the four basic operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. The result of addition is called sum. The result of subtraction it's a difference. If we talk about the result of multiplication, that's a product. And finally, the result of division is called quotient. So let's start with addition. What other words indicate addition? Well, we can hear plus. We can add something. We can talk about a total. Total means add all the entries. Some other phrases indicating addition include more than, increased by, but also together or all together and perimeter. Why perimeter? Well, because if you have any polygon and you want to find the perimeter, you need to add all the sides, for example, A, B, C, and D. So perimeter indicates addition. Let's go to subtraction. How subtraction can be recognized? Well, we can hear minus or subtract from less than or less. Also decreased by or decreased by and diminished. Obviously this list can be extended. Those are just the most commonly used words or phrases. I want you to focus for a second on these two phrases. Those are very exceptional phrases. Why? Because they go kind of backwards. For example, if I will say B subtract from A what I have in mind is I have to have something to subtract B from. This something is A. So the expression that corresponds to this phrase is you start with A and then you subtract B. Similarly, B less than A will also translate into A minus B because we have B less than some original number which is called A. However, if we use just a single word less, for example, B less A, oh, this time we go from the left to the right. So the corresponding expression will be B less A, just like that. So pay attention between these two phrases. The only backward structure phrases are subtract from and less than. Other than that, we read from the left to the right. Okay, let's look at the multiplication list. Well, we can multiply, we can times something, but quite often we will use this little word off. Off means multiply. It could be, for example, half of, half of 10 is 5. What does it mean? We multiply 10 by 1 half. Half of, instead of of multiplication, 10 is 5. So even though when we perform this multiplication, we may get confused with the division because this problem could be written as 10 over 2. So that will be division. But if we're using a fraction 1 half, then we multiply. Here we're using a number 2, not a fraction anymore. That's why we have a division. Obviously, in both cases, this is equal to 5. Okay, we can say half as much as. So instead of half of, half as much as, but that still indicates multiplication by one half. Twice. Twice means multiply by two. Two times something, 2x. Triple. It means three times something. And here's an interesting word, area. Area indicates that we multiply, usually base times height. So base, height, that will be area of a rectangle, but also parallelogram, rhombus, triangle. Well, the triangle won't be just base, it will be half a base, but still the idea is that we multiply something that is connected with base with something that is connected with height. So area indicates multiplication, perimeter indicates addition. And in the last column we have words that indicate division. So we can say divide something by something. We can refer to a ratio. Ratio means division like A over B, division bar. We can say out of, for example, 4x out of 12 is 
brown so that will be like a ratio four out of twelve could be written this way but it also could be written as a fraction for twelves per like per hundred per means division let's say five per hundred that really means five percent per percent the cent refers to a hundred in the denominator shared for example we share cookies among five children cut into a piece of rope can be cut into let's say three sections so remember of means multiply and out of divide and as i mentioned before this list can be definitely extended with some other words now let's practice translating from word description into algebraic expression or equation so here we have a table on the left hand side we will have given a phrase or a sentence we need to recognize that and on the right hand side we need to write the corresponding expression or equation remember expression corresponds to a phrase equation corresponds to a sentence so the first example we have the sum of double a number and one and these two words sum and end are in bold why well because well first of all the sum indicates addition so we can write at the middle of the line plus sign but addition and all other basic operations are really binary operations what does it mean it means that we have to have two things in order to add them so we reserve two spots on each side of addition for incoming expressions now this end word tells us where this plus supposed to be placed so here's a position of plus and then we have two incoming expressions on the left hand side of our addition we'll have double a number and on the right hand side one okay one is pretty obvious so let's mark it one here and double a number well remember double indicates multiplication by two so two times unknown number now for the unknown number we can assume any letter that we wish it could be x could be n or any other letter that you like let's put it x for now okay so this is the expression that can be read as the sum of double the number and one let's see the next example the difference of squares of two numbers okay difference is the key word and there is no end here however it's a difference of squares of two numbers so we'll have two numbers we're going to square them and then make a difference between them okay let's place the minus at the middle of the line and then for two numbers we need to assume two variables for example x and y however it's not just a difference of two numbers it's a difference of squares of those two numbers so we are squaring x we're squaring y and subtracting them okay what's the next problem oh here i notice a period that means i have a sentence which indicates that i'm going to write an equation rather than expression okay let's read half of a number decreased by three is 18 is always indicates equal sign so we'll have equal sign here and on the right hand side of equal is 18 that's for sure now what's before equal half of a number decreased by three with a comma after the half of the number so half of a number will be one half times certain number let's call it x and then it's decreased by three after i perform this half of a number then i decrease by three and it's equal 18. okay let's see next one the quotient of a number and four okay quotient of a number and four it's a division x divided by four plus the number and it is after comma so this comma tells me that i need to perform this operation before i add the number this the word really indicates that i refer to the same number that i originally took that means i need to use x can't use any other letter here so plus the number equals to 10 equals pretty straightforward equals to 10. so here's an equation again let's see the next example okay hmm it looks nearly the same as the previous example is that a mistake 
the only difference between these two sentences is this comma, and there is no comma here. Let's see how this will be read. The quotient of a number and 4 plus the number. So it's one full phrase. And then we stop. Okay, so quotient. I need to look for the end word that will indicate where should I place the quotient. The quotient of a number and 4 plus the number because there is no comma here so we're not ending after 4. We go 4 plus the number. The whole phrase needs to be taken. Okay, so the quotient will be positioned exactly here where the end indicates. Quotient of a number, let's call it x, and 4 plus the number, 4 plus the number, equals to 10. So, you see, there is a difference. This difference is really in order of operation. On the left-hand side, in the first example, the last operation that we perform is this addition. Why? In the second example, the last operation that we perform is the division. So even one little comma changes the meaning. We have to be really careful how we read the question. Okay, let's look at the next example. The area of a square with a side A is 20. If I have a square with side A, then area is really A times A. A square is 20, so it's equal to 20. I think this is pretty straightforward question. Okay, next one. A number subtracted from 5 is 1 less than, remember less than, it's a backward structure, 1 less than the number. And here we have the word is. Is indicates equation, so we'll have equation at the middle. Okay, on the left hand side we have a number subtracted from 5. Well, we can see another backwards phrase, subtracted from. So, a number subtracted from 5 tells me that I need to have 5 in order to subtract a number. Let's call it x, 5 minus x. Is is equal 1 less than the number. So, 1 less than the number. I have to have the number in order to subtract 1. Backward structure again. Okay, see the next example. Perfect square of the sum of two numbers. So, sum of two numbers, I'm going to write here, choose numbers x and y, the sum is x plus y. And now it's a perfect square of it. So I need to take the whole thing and square it. Perfect square is the most outside operation. Perfect square of the sum of two numbers. In the last example, 4% of the product of two consecutive even numbers. Okay, so now I need to recall how can we represent consecutive even numbers. If one number is called, for example, n, then the next consecutive even number will be called n plus 2 because they are consecutive even, so they jump by 2. Now, the product, well, product means we need to multiply these two numbers. The product of two consecutive even numbers. And then what we do with it is we're taking 4% off. This off represents multiplication and 4% needs to be converted to a numerical value, which is 0 0.04. So altogether, that's the expression 0.04n times n plus 2. We can rewrite this n and n plus 2 a little bit closer to each other. So it will look just like this. Okay, since we already reviewed the keywords and practice how to translate certain phrases or sentences from English to algebraic expressions or equations, now it's time to start working with application problems. On this slide, I put together general guidelines or hints for solving word problems. No matter how intimidating a word problem can be, please don't avoid them. You need to practice as many as you can, especially when you have troubles with word problems. The word problems can't be learned other than just doing them. So please don't avoid them. However, the following points may help you in dealing with word problems. So my first advice will be read them. Read them really carefully and read them a couple times, at least twice. 
The first time when you read them, focus on general settings. So try to recognize what type of problem it is. Is it a motion problem, investment problem, proportion, geometry, age, maybe mixture or solution problem, work problem, number problem, etc. Why? Well, because if you recognize what type of problem it is, and hopefully you've done some of those types, it will be easier for you to organize the data, set up equation and solve it. Now, second time when you read this, you already know what kind of setting it is. The second time focus on information that is given in a problem and what needs to be found. Sometimes this is not very obvious. Sometimes maybe you have more information that you need. So please ask yourself, what is it that you are after? Now, after you have some idea what's given, what you need to find and what kind of problem is that, draw appropriate tables or diagrams to picture out the situation and organize your data. Organize your data in a useful way, that means maybe in some tables, maybe using diagrams, maybe a simple picture. Also list all relevant formulas that pertain to the problem. Okay, after that, we are getting closer to setting up some sort of formulas or equations to solve. In order to do that, we usually need to assign a variable or variables, depending what is the unknown. Usually, this is what the question asks for. When you assign a variable, make sure that you write a let statement. It can be a short statement, but make sure that you clearly define what this variable stands for. Sometimes, for example, if it's a geometry problem, it's enough to label this variable on the diagram or just put a short phrase, what your variable stands for. For example, let's t represents the calling time or let's n represents the number of people going for a trip. Also, look for the units because sometimes in a problem you have different data given and each data is in different units. So, check what needs to be found and what are the units that the question asks for. Convert all other units into the desired units. After that, express other unknown values in terms of the variable or variables that you already introduced. So don't introduce more variables than it's actually needed. For example, if you think about consecutive numbers, if the first variable is n, the consecutive one will be n plus 1. You don't say n and m. You don't introduce another letter here. You still use the same letter. After that, we are really prepared to set up the equation or equations. So write those equations either by following a formula. Those could be formulas that you use in the table. For example, rate times time equals distance. Some formula from geometry. For example, area of certain shape or any other common sense pattern. So it could be a relation between numbers. After you have already your equation or equations written down, I would say this is like 80% of the question done. Now what's enough is just to solve the equation and usually this is not a big problem. However, that's not all. After we solve the equation for the variable, check if the solution is reasonable if it makes sense, if the denominations make sense, and after that, give a formal answer. So, could be a short sentence, but this is another double checking point if we actually found what we've been asking for. Okay, let's summarize our points. First, rate, rate a couple times, and organize your data. Then get a variable and write the equation. Finally, solve the equation, check if your answer makes sense, and give the formal answer. Let's look at commonly used patterns, formulas, and tables. We'll discuss certain types of problems, and the first such type will be numerical problems. In numerical problems, watch for relations between numerical quantities. Those relations could be stated in a sentence, or the question could refer to consecutive numbers. As soon as you hear consecutive numbers, list the expressions that will describe the first few consecutive numbers. If we start with an unknown number n, then the next consecutive number is 
n plus 1, because they differ by 1, and the following one will be n plus 2, then n plus 3, and so on. Now, if we talk about consecutive either even or odd, both of these categories can be recorded as, let's start with any unknown number, and then the next such number will differ from the previous by 2, so the next must be n plus 2, and the following one n plus 4, and so on. Notice that it doesn't matter if we talk about consecutive even or consecutive odd, the same expressions will describe the situation. For example, if n is even, 4, then n plus 2 is 6, n plus 4 is 8. So we indeed produce consecutive even numbers. The same is true for odd numbers. For example, if n is 5, then n plus 2 is 7, then n plus 4 is 9. So yes, these formulas produce consecutive odd numbers. Everything depends what we start with, either even or odd. Okay, let's look at the first example. Find two consecutive even numbers, consecutive even, such that 3 times the first plus twice the second is 254. So, we know it's a problem about number relations, and we know that we need to refer to consecutive even numbers. The first thing that I would suggest you do is put down the formulas for the first two consecutive even numbers which is n and n plus 2. Now we refer to these two quantities by following the description. 3 times the first plus twice the second is 254. So here we have the same exercise as on the second slide when we transformed English into mathematical sentences. We see the word is which corresponds to the equation. So let's start with the equation. Something is equal to 254. Okay, this side was easy. Now let's analyze what's written on the left side. 3 times the first. Okay, that first refers to the first number out of our two consecutive even numbers. So let's start with 3 times n, 3 times the first, plus Okay, let's write plus. Twice the second refers to the second number. So twice this whole number. Since this number is written with two terms, we need a bracket. n plus 2 in a bracket. Okay, so we have our equation. The majority of the question is already done. Now we just need to solve it. So let's release the bracket. 3n plus 2n plus 4 distributive property equals 254. Collect like terms, we'll have 5n and move the 4 to the other side, that really means we're subtracting 4. So 254 minus 4 is 250. Finally, we divide the whole equation by 5, so this 5 is gone and n becomes 250 divided by 5, which is 50. But is that the end of our question? Well, not really. Let's see what the question asks for. Find two consecutive even numbers. Okay, we have one number. Where's the second one? Oh, the second one follows this rule. The second number is n plus 2, so it's 50 plus 2, it's 52. Now we have the two consecutive numbers. We are ready to give the final answer. The two consecutive even numbers are 50 and 52. The next type of problems will be percent problems. There are two major rules to remember when we deal with percent problems. First of all, 1 is the same as 100%. This is pretty obvious, but it helps you to remember which way should you move the decimal dot when you convert from a number to percent or the other way around. So, from a number to percent, what we do, we make the number larger. So the dot will travel to the right. To gain the percent sign, we move the decimal dot two places, multiply by 100. However, to drop the percent sign, we are actually dividing by 100. So I'm moving the decimal dot to the left.
The second golden rule is in any relation with percent, the percent out of a hundred works the same way as a part of a whole. For example, if 4x out of 12 is brown, what is the percent of brown x in relation to all x? Well, the percent is unknown, so let's put unknown instead of percent sign, and a hundred here. So you see this is really helpful to set up a proportion and solve for x. We know how to solve such proportion by cross multiplying. The x would be equal, multiply whatever you see across, and then divide by the remaining number. So we go 4 times 100 is 400, and then divide by 12. This turned out to be approximately 33.3%, about 33%. Notice that I like to make a little shortcut here. Instead of writing 12x, this cross multiplication equals to 4 times 100, 400, I wrote at once that x is equal 400 divided by 12, because sooner or later we are dividing by this 12. So it's a good idea to remember this rule when you solve proportion like this. Write the unknown and then multiply across the numbers that you see and divide by the number that was not used before. This way you solve such proportion in one step. Okay, let's see the first example. The average price of one bedroom apartment in BC rose from 115,000 in 2009 to 121,000 in 2010. What percent increase was this to the nearest tenth of a percent? Okay, in this question we are asked of percent increase. Well, in order to find percent of increase, we need to know what is the increase first. The increase is the last number minus the original number. So it's 121,000 minus 115,000, which equals 6,000. So $6,000 increase. Since we want to find the percent increase, let's introduce a variable. Let's P be the percent increase. So if we refer to this golden rule, is a part of a whole, the same way as percent out of a hundred. We can set up a proportion where we compare two fractions, and on the right hand side we have a percent p that we don't know, out of a hundred. It is the same as part of a whole. Our part of a whole is the increase out of the base number. The base number is the one that we started with. So increase out of base number, which in our case it's 6,000 out of 115,000. That's equal p over 100. Since we have so many zeros, we can reduce some. For example, three zeros from the bottom and three zeros from the top. We'll have little bit smaller numbers to deal with. So now to solve this proportion, we have p equals, and we start cross multiplying like before. So we multiply the numbers that we have given, 6 times 100, 600, over the remaining number, in this case is 115, because remember we already crossed out the zeros. So when we use a calculator, this is approximately 5.2. And P was already in percent, so that's 5.2 really represents percent, one place value. We're ready to give the final answer. The average price of a one-bedroom apartment in BC increased by approximately 5.2 percent between 2009 and 2010. And one more type of problems, number value problems. For this type of problems, I would suggest that you draw a table as follows. In one row, try to keep number of items, and in the second row, try to keep value of those items. So the idea is not to mix them up, but try to create equation that refers to number of items, first type of items, second type, and a total, and then value of those items. Let's see particular example. For a bill totaling $2.55, a cashier received 15 coins consisting of dimes and quarters. 
how many of each denominations of coins did the cashier receive. So here are our two categories, dimes and quarters. Each dime has its value, it's 10 cents. And each quarter has its value, it's 25 cents. As you see in the question, we are referring to the number of coins and the value of all those coins. Since the question is, how many of each denomination of coins did the cashier receive? And we have two types of denominations, dimes and quarters. We need to introduce a variable and hopefully just one variable. So let's put t for dimes. We can write a let statement. Let d represents the number of dimes. Then what expression will represent the number of quarters? Since we have 15 coins in total, the 15 minus d is the rest. So those are the quarters. Okay, if we have both of these expressions, we can fill up the table. The number of dimes is d, because that's the variable that we introduced. And since the total is 15, then the number of quarters will be 15 minus d. Now, to fill up the row with value of coins, we need to multiply the number of coins times the value of one coin. Since one dime represents 10 cents, we can write 10 times d. But then remember, this expression will give us amount of money in cents. So all other entries, let's make it in cents as well. Since the value of one quarter is 25, and the number of those quarters is stated here, then we multiply the 25, the value of one quarter, times the number of quarters. This needs to be done in a bracket, just because there is two terms, not one. Finally, the total. Oh, the total is given in a problem. However, remember, we are in cents. So convert this $2.55 into cents. That will be 255 cents. Our equation will come from the last row when we compare values. The total value of dimes plus the total value of quarters is the total value of all coins. Let's write down this equation on the side and then we'll just need to solve it. We are solving it by releasing the bracket and collecting like terms. 15 times 25 is 375 minus 25d equals 255. So 10d minus 25d is negative 15d. And then on the right we have 255 minus 375. Okay, finally d equals negative 120. And then we have to divide by the leading coefficient, negative 15. So altogether we have eight dimes. Okay, since we know how many dimes, it's easy to figure out how many quarters. Number of quarters equals 15 minus d, which is 15 minus 8, so it's 7. And we are ready to give the final answer. The cashier received eight dimes and seven quarters.